everyone, my name is Rose Chiachi and I'm the Executive Director of the Pike County Public Library. I'm here to today to tell you how to sign up for a library card. If you're a Pike County resident, it's really easy. You just stop by with proof of residency and a photo ID and we'll get you all signed up. If you're not a resident, it's also really easy. You can just stop by with a photo ID and for $35, you'll have full access to all of the library resources. Unfortunately, right now our buildings aren't open to the public, but you can still sign up for a library card on our website, www.pcpl.org. Whether you're doing research for a project or looking for some inspiration, we can absolutely help you find what you're looking for. A really cool thing about libraries is that if we don't have the item that you're looking for, we can find it for you, no problem. We have a huge network of libraries in Pennsylvania and the entire country that we can borrow from on your behalf. Please check out our website, www.pcpl.org, for all of the virtual opportunities we're offering right now, or give us a call with any questions. Finally, I want to thank everyone from Peters Valley for bringing these great programs to our community and including the library. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy the program. Hi, everyone. Welcome. I am Brianne Rosner. I am the Gallery and Craft Fair Director at Peters Valley, and I am your MC for tonight. Uh, this program is made in partnership between Peters Valley School of Craft and the Pike County uh, Public Library in Milford, Pennsylvania, and it's funded by the Richard L. Snyder Fund and the Greater Pike Community Foundation. Uh, you can visit Peters Valley's YouTube channel for all of the past lectures. Um, so Don, at the end of Don's presentation tonight, um, he will answer all of your questions. So. If you do have a question at any time, you can put them in the question and answer, which if you see at the bottom of your screen, it says Q&A all the way to the right. So just leave your questions there and we will ask Don at the end of the presentation. So let me introduce Donald Friedlich. Donald Friedlich received his BFA from Rhode Island School of Design and served, as, served a term as president of the Society of North American Goldsmiths. He has lectured at conferences and universities and taught workshops and held artists in residencies all over the world. In 2015, he joined the board of the Craft Emergency Relief Fund, and he was a featured speaker at SOFA Chicago. In 2016, he was the keynote speaker at the SNAG conference in Asheville, North Carolina, and was a Renwick Alliance Distinguished Artist Speaker at the Smithsonian. His work is in the permanent collections of the Smithsonian American Art Museum, the Victoria and Albert Museum, the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, and the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, the Corning Museum of Glass, and many others. Donald is a leading figure in contemporary glass, and we are thrilled to have him speak to us tonight. So welcome, Donald. Thank you all for coming and uh, joining us on, in Zoom land out there. Uh, I really appreciate it, and I hope I can provide an entertaining hour for you. Um, so what I'm going to do is mainly talk about my own work and career, but I'm going to start with something a little broader than that. Um, this is the class I'm teaching this summer at Peters Valley, um, and um, if you're interested, please apply. So what I'd like to start with is what I love about the field of contemporary jewelry and metalsmithing. I love the form. Dennis Nahabishan's wonderful electroform vessel forms. June Schwartz, the late great June Schwartz, also doing electroforming with enamel. I love the color. Helen Shirk working with colored pencil and gesso on raised and chased vessels. Ramon Puchkuas from Spain creates visual poems from a wide range of materials. I love the obsession. Sergei Jetvatin is working here with watch hands that have all been constructed together. He's kind of a brain surgeon of a jeweler. And Giovanni Carvaya works with impossibly fine materials. Uh, by my taste, he's the finest goldsmith working in the world today. Wim DeVoe creates full-scale trucks out of pierced uh, corten steel, laser cut. I love the sensuality. Melanie Bellinker works with human hair 
glued to a substrate to make drawings and portraits of herself. Vivian Beer makes fluid, a material that is not naturally tended towards that uh, steel to make furniture. I love the humor. Arthur Hash uses 3D printing to blow up commercial jewelry findings to a hip hop scale. Felicia Vandulis has her own menagerie of crazy little animals. I love the history. Myra Mimlich Gray mines both process and form to create very unique vessel forms. Suzanne Rizak works with a wide range of colored golds and other metals. Uh, these pieces are inspired by historical shards of ceramic. I love the materials. Joan Parcher works with graphite or mica. Tiff Slemons works with an endless supply of found objects. I love the design. Wendy Stevens makes elegant handbags using technology. Ted Muling, one of my favorite jewelers. If Frank Cousy was a jeweler, he would be Ted Muling. I love the technology. Bathsheba Grossman uses 3D printing to make small objects for the desk and for the hand. Joshua DeMonte takes uh, Gothic architecture and makes it wearable, albeit theatrical. And most of all, I love the next generation. I have a passion for helping emerging artists. Kishin Wang from, Wang from Korea uses steel binding wire and enamel to make light but dramatic jewelry. Lynn Batchelter uh, works with the drawn line as inspiration. Demitham Ludis looks to construction sites and the aesthetic of decay. Sophie Kwan makes light jewelry out of plastic, uh, looking to the natural world for inspiration. Lauren Tickle works with US currency. These are all made out of, literally made out of money uh, in this brooch. So I call my lecture things that make my heart beat faster. Art, artistic approaches vary widely, but I think of mine as at least in part to be being one of discernment of finding the things that excite me visually, emotionally, and intellectually, and try to understand why that is, and then try to bring those qualities into my work. And I call them things that make my heart beat faster. I grew up in what could now be called the Soprano section of New Jersey. And as a child, I had no interest in art whatsoever. Uh, the other little junior gangster here uh, is my cousin Gordon who went on to be national editor of US News and World Report, among other things. He's a journalist. His area of expertise is a Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, but I went in another direction. I'm on the left, by the way. Um, so I started making jewelry. Um, I met a jeweler skiing in my early 20s. As I said, I had no interest in art as a kid. I wanted to be Thomas Edison when I grew up. I, I was interested in math and science. But um, I got kind of dis disillusioned with that. And uh, I met a jeweler skiing named June Mandel in Stowe, Vermont. And she started to teach me that summer. Uh, eventually, that led to taking classes with Lori Peters at the University of Vermont, uh, working for about a year as an apprentice with Timothy Brannis, uh, also in the Burlington area, and then transferring to RISD uh, in 1979. At RISD, I got interested in alternative materials. These are titanium and um, uh, ebony and layers of woolen fabric. I was turned on to a book called How to Wrap Five More Eggs, and it's a book of photographs of traditional Japanese wrapping and packaging. And I was taken by the simplicity, the directness, uh, the composition of these wonderful objects. At RISD, Oops. Uh, at RISD, Dale Chihuly, a uh, renowned glass artist, taught our professional practices class. And Dale said to apply our creativity, not just to our art, but to our marketing, our presentation, and our life. And uh, that class was hugely helpful. Um, 
he would bring in a painter and they talk about how they were selling oriental rugs to support their painting. And it gave me an idea of what a life as a professional artist would be. And it gave me a bit of a trail of breadcrumbs, if you will, to follow uh, when I got out of school. It made me feel much more confident uh, in approaching galleries. Uh, I've also had a lifelong love of Japanese gardens. Here in my work, trying to bring these wrapping ideas into it. Working with some hollow forms, these are sterling and gold. And this is towards the end of my time at RISD. Um, I found a piece of slate and I, you know, it's funny how some of those random occurrences can change the direction of your life, but that piece of stone did. So here I'm trying to get the feeling of kind of geological forms being forced apart uh, in my brooch. And it's always deceptive in these things because Andy Goldsworthy's piece on the left is, you know, 50 feet long and mine is an inch and a half on a side. But this kind of presentation, everything looks the same scale. Um, I kind of like that, but it's also a little perverse. Um, so Chihuly said, in photography, look for the two eyes, information and impact. Uh, it was a good lesson. And here is, here are two versions of the same photograph, they're the same object, and you can see how much better it can look. The RISD faculty always said, present yourself to your best advantage, present your work to your best advantage. And I've always tried to do that. So I got out of school and I set two primary goals. I'm gonna go back. Um, two primary goals. One, I wanted to make a living at my work. And two, I wanted to continue the artistic development that I found so satisfying at school. To do the first, um, I applied to the three leading craft shows in the country. In the country. And to do the second, I sent portfolios to the three leading galleries in the country. And within the first year, I got into all three craft shows and I got into all three galleries. I was very fortunate. Um, but before I could do any of that, I decided it was time to do something I hadn't done for 11 years, get a haircut. So uh, the first thing that happened was um, I got a note scribbled diagonally on a piece of paper from Robert Lee Morris at Artwork Gallery, where I'd sent my portfolio saying, Mr. Morris would like to see your work uh, come down for an appointment. And I did immediately. And um, he separated my work into two piles. One was everything else I had made. And the other was uh, this pair of earrings and this necklace. And he said, I have a new artist show opening in a month. I'd like you to do a collection of, of earrings based on these two designs and come back to me in two weeks. And maybe I'll put you in the show. And I don't know where I had the nerve to say this, but I said, two weeks isn't enough. If I spend time coming down here, um, uh, it'll take away from my studio time, and I'd really like to get a commitment from you now. What the hell was I thinking? So Robert got up from the table and started to walk away and then turned over his shoulder and said, all right, let's do it. So this is the first of many times my big mouth had gotten me into a situation where I really had to put up or shut up. I developed uh, about 20, 25 new earring designs in that one month. And they became the, the basis of my production line. These are sterling and selectively gold-plated, which turned into a bit of a nightmare later on, which I'll explain. But uh, my sentiment here, I've always looked to my one-of-a-kind work to inspire my production line. So after doing one show and not doing very well, um, the veteran guy next to me said, kid, before your next show, you need a low end. And that meant a low end item. Um, and I started these little pins called closed pins uh, as a student. They were a cold connection problem my sophomore year. And I started off stitching metal together. And then from that came stitching little clothes. And then I needed six more connections. They had to have 12 different cold connections in one thing. I needed six more connections, so I made a little 7th Avenue New York clothes rack that wheeled around, and it was cute and kind of silly, and, um, but it solved the problem. And that summer, I was taking a workshop with Bob Ebendorf at Penland, and I put a pin back on one of my little jackets, 
and put it in the auction. And three of the faculty were bidding to kill for this thing. And I thought maybe I have an item here. Uh, at that same workshop, Ivy Ross, who's a brilliant fashion jewelry designer, uh, now running Google Glass out in California, uh, who was Bob Ebendorf's girlfriend at the time and now ex-wife, uh, told me about commercial photo etching. And um, I worked with the same company she turned me on to, a place called Chemart in Lincoln, Rhode Island. And the etching cuts out the shape, it pierces, it can do a half etch, which is the score lines where the lapels bend. It etches my signature and copyright sign in the back. And these just fold up like paper dolls. <clears throat> After a while, my apartment looked like some sort of leprechaun rummage sale. There were just thousands of these little things all over the place. These were really good for me for a very long time. And they, they retailed for 16 to $28. So they were very affordable. So Andy Goldsworthy said it was very important when I could discover it, I could actually learn from making art. Instead of being a means of dumping my feelings, it acted, feelings or ideas, it acted as a kind of vehicle for getting information. Here I'm working with Slate which in this case, it was an old chalkboard I found that was smashed, that I smashed up. And that became my major art supply for more than 10 years. I traveled in the American Southwest <coughs> and was just knocked out by the landscape, especially the effect of erosion on stone and time. This is Bryce Canyon, one of my favorite places in the country. Um, and um, when I got home, I translated these erosion ideas by working with a sandblaster to literally erode away the slate. And slate is quite soft and it carves really beautifully with a sandblaster. Noguchi said, I love the use of stone because it's the most flexible and meaning impregnated material. The whole world is made of stone. It's nothing new. It's as old as the hills. It is our fundament. So I mentioned I had problems with selectively gold plating my earrings. I had an idea for a new material that was a lamination of sterling and 18 karat gold. And after a long period of searching around for somebody to manufacture this stuff for me, I finally found Stern Leach in Attleboro, Massachusetts who was willing to do it. And this material up until about six months ago was widely available through Hauser Miller, but Stern Leach has stopped making it unfortunately, but I developed it the specs and got it manufactured and then turned the field over, uh, to, turned it over to the field so other artists could work with it. So it gave me the color quality of the gold, but closer to the uh, cost of the silver. I got interested in the idea that a brooch lives in a fabric environment and I used negative space in this piece. So the fabric the brooch is worn on became part of the composition. This is a theme that continues to this day in various ways. So in production work, design decisions become lifestyle choices. If you design a line of high polished rings, for instance, or earrings, you're gonna spend your life polishing. Uh, I knew I didn't wanna do that. So in designing this line of earrings and cufflinks, I literally knocked off my one of a kind work. I took a mold off of the slate to get the texture then sweat soldered on some of the bimetal uh, that had been roller printed with paper uh, to get that texture. And the reason for it is aesthetic and it connected with my one of a kind work. But the other reason for it is that it finishes really, really quickly. All I have to do is finish the edges of the castings. And uh, the main surface is just hit with a steel brush and it's done easy peasy. Uh, I was looking for a way to bring color into my work and my father redecorated his bathroom in New York and um, there were all these ceramic tile samples around and I grabbed them they look like art supplies to me. I also did some work in glass and uh, semi-precious stone, the bottom one is in sodalite. Uh, this glass piece was the second one in glass that I ever made and it got into the new glass review. And that's a publication of the Corning Museum of Glass of 100 pieces in glass done in any given calendar year. And I was thrilled to get into it. And then years later, I was on the editorial board of Metalsmith Magazine and 
Bruce Metcalf and I both came to the editorial board with a similar idea that there ought to be some sort of annual um, uh, in, in jewelry. I was looking at the New Glass Review. He was looking at industrial design annuals. And we worked with the editorial board and then the snag board to develop what became the exhibition in print for the next more than 20 years, 25 years. So Noguchi said, speaking of his, Brent, his mentor, Brancusi, Brancusi, like the Japanese, would take the quintessence of nature and distill it. He taught me the truth of materials and to keep my sculptures undecorated like the Japanese house. So my brooch here is a Brazilian agate that I've carved with a sandblaster. Also worked with tiger, tiger eye a bit and uh, more Brazilian agate on the bottom. And one of the byproducts of the sandblasting is materials with uneven hardnesses carve at a different rate. So in the tiger eye, the yellow part was softer than the, the brown area. And so it carved more deeply. So you've got a nice connection between the surface and the form. I did a little bit of work with black stripe agate and some diamond inlay. So um, this bracelet, I collaborated with a German company and they cut the blank and then I carved it as you see, and then I carved it in the reverse way on the other side. Um, but this is here for more for the Andy Goldsworthy piece than for mine. Um, to me, this is the greatest grant proposal I've ever heard of my entire life. Andy Goldsworthy's proposal was to make site-specific sculpture out of snow at the North Pole. How could any arts organization turn this down? And the work is fabulous, of course, Gasola's work is fabulous, but uh, I just think the idea of it is brilliant. So in production, production work is a design challenge, not a sellout. Um, the recession of the early 90s hit, and I went back to the slate and developed a new body of sterling earrings and cufflinks. And my goal was to make something I could retail for 50 or $60. And to me, designing production is the ultimate design challenge. Uh, I can make one of a kind work all day long, but to, to be able to make an, an earring that has my own individual um, personality and quality uh, that I can sell retail for $60 is a really hard thing to do. And I feel very good if I can do it anywhere near decently. And the class this summer is gonna be pointed towards things like this. So um, I had an idea for a new approach to Sam last thing to bring pattern to my work. And I didn't wanna waste my agate um, which was on the pricey side. So I found some glass on a dumpster and carved it. And uh, I ended up liking the glass as much or more than I liked the agate. So this is one piece of glass, clear window glass. It's literally the glass I found in the dumpster. And I've messed it off with a perforated sheet metal and it's backed in a metal called niobium that can be anodized to change its color. So the color is completely separate from the glass. It's behind the glass. And this one is the same sort of approach here. I've used a, a, a stainless steel screen as a resist. Um, after a while, I was really able to control this process. And one thing that happens with a sandblasting is on the top, the, the holes carve in a cone shape, conically, unlike a drill bit, which would be a cylinder. So after I take the resist away uh, and I carve it more, the deeper I go, the smaller the hole gets. And I get this nice fluidity into a material that's completely resistant to it, stone, uh, in this case, black onyx. Uh, I've always done stuff for men and I like that. And that seems to be a good market for me to do uh, cufflinks. And I wanted to bring the pattern ideas into my production line and develop this collection. At times I bring my hand in very lightly, simply beveling a piece of stone um, as Scott Burton did with his chair here. Uh, two simple cuts in a large boulder to define a functional object, albeit I think a fairly uncomfortable one. I did some work with Brazilian slate, uh, yeah, Brazilian slate, which has these layers uh, in it. And again, very lightly bringing my hand in. 
So my teacher, Jack Pripp, said, if you do 10 variations on this, one of them will just purr. And I've always worked in series. And part of the thinking behind that is to put a coherent collection of objects together for a show. Um, but it's also the way my brain works, to take an idea um, and, um, and find variations on it. So the piece on the, on the right with the framework in it, that goes back to some of the early framework pieces I was doing before. But after working with um, black onyx and agates, which are about a seven on a hardness scale of 10, um, going back to the slate was just butter to work with. I found a whole new range of things I could do with the material. And because I was working with the harder materials, I got I had gotten all this water cooled diamond abrasive equipment, which made this work so much easier to do. So I knew Metalsmith Magazine was working on a feature article on me, and I really wanted the cover. Being the son of a New York ad man, I really wanted the cover. And this piece and the one before with a diagonal, this one on the left, uh, were my two favorite pieces. So when we photographed them, and at the time we were using four by five transparencies, which were a big pain, uh, but absolutely gorgeous. But you got a single speck of dust in it and the photos ruined. Um, so they were very demanding. Uh, no Photoshop available back then. So when we photographed this, we photographed it as you see, and we photographed it also as a portrait. <clears throat> you know, so upright image. And I knew the graphic designer's favorite trick was to take a color from an image, drop out the name Metalsmith along the top and use that color in the name. And the magazine came out and he did exactly what I thought he'd do. So I made his job really easy, gave him a gorgeous picture of a strong piece and he did what I was hoping he would do. Um, so I went back to the glass a bit um, and um, the cord on these is actually weed whacker line, string trimmer from your hardware store, which was a perfect match for the frosted glass. And these are all still cold worked. And um, the one on the left is uh, over niobium again. And the niobium has a very directional color quality. So as the piece moves, the color intensity will shift. And that's also something I work with today. Uh, graduation may be the end of your schooling, but it's just the beginning of your education. So for a few years, I've been looking to take a workshop, preferably with somebody from Europe or Asia at Haystack or Penland or Peter Sally. And finally, um, there was a class taught by J David Watkins, who was head of the jewelry program at the Royal College of Art in London. Uh, three-week class at Haystack, and I jumped on it. And we mainly made jewelry, but David also had us do something for a grove of trees. And I, in the crease between these two saplings, I made this sort of bad Andy Goldsworthy knockoff. And uh, it was fun to do, and great not to have to make a pin back on something. And um, uh, I didn't think it would affect me that much, but I got home, and it immediately shaped the direction of my work. I started carving the slate into these soft, organic, stick-like forms. And the one with the little knot hole is in the permanent collection of the Victoria and Albert Museum in London uh, in their jewelry display and is out on their, as part of their permanent collection. It's out on display. So at this point, the glass took over full time. This is about 1997. So why glass? Simply stated, glass is the most flexible three-dimensional material ever created. Now, I could see a ceramicist give me, giving me an argument on that, but I stand by it. Uh, it can be as clear as water or as opaque as, st as stone. Uh, it can be translucent, transparent, or reflective, or all three at the same time. Uh, it can be thousands of colors, and it can be just about any form in the world. Um, it can be blown, it can be cold worked, it can be etched, it can be um, slumped and fused and so many more processes. And I've just had a great time exploring it. For the jewelers out there uh, who always wanna see the back of a piece, here's the pin back. 
Um, and I developed a unique pin back using square tubing. Um, and it's a little complicated to try to explain in this, so I'm not going to, but um, if you want to write me afterwards, I'm happy to talk about it. I did a little bit of work with these slender glass rods. These have to be hammer set in place. These are one eighth diameter, one eighth inch diameter rods uh, in a gold frame. And a little bit of work with dichroic glass as well. So uh, in 1999, I had sort of exhausted what I could do with my limited glass skills. And I started traveling to upstate New York to the studio of the Corning Museum of Glass, uh, which is a fabulous summer and winter program um, with one or two week workshops taught by leading artists from all over the world. Um, and now I also teach there uh, from time to time. It's one of my favorite places to teach. It's a great facility for teaching glass. Um, so um, going to Corning, things that were taking me uh, a day, I could do in 30 minutes. The, one of the, my main tools is something called a flat lap, which is a rotating abrasive disc um, that's horizontal, like a table. And uh, at home, my flat lap was six inches. At Corning, it was two feet. So things that were taking me forever at home, I could just do quickly at Corning. And it was hugely freeing artistically. Uh, I, I could avoid making something that did, didn't work. And, um, uh, you know, it wasn't a massive waste of time. So that risk is really important in creativity. Um, in 2003, I was the first jeweler to be giving an artist in residence at Corning. These are very prestigious international competitions and uh, they give out, now they're, I think they're up to about 10 a year. At the time they were just giving out six and it's a month and you develop a proposal of what you wanna do with the time. And if they go for it, you get free access to everything there. <coughs> so one of my parts of my proposal was to work with a glass blower and that's where the piece on the bottom came from, the necklace. Um, and earlier, um, uh, the piece on the left is um, actually not from the residency. It was a collaboration with a master lamp worker named Emilio Santini. And my charge to him was, um, can we make a glass necklace without any metal fittings? So the way this works is um, the rod on the back slides through the coil to expose the neck opening, and then you put it on and then slide it back around and it locks in place. Um, the other part of my proposal was to work with uh, an engraver and the engraver was Max Erlacher. Max has been engraving glass since he was 14 years old in Austria. He got his master's degree uh, as in mastery, not as an MFA uh, with Loebmeyer, uh, fine glass house in Austria and then moved to the States and was a lead, a lead engraver at Stuban Glass for many years. And I'd gotten to know Max during my time in Corning. So, um, uh, and Max has mad skills. I mean, just crazy skills. And um, so I would draw on, on a piece and then go up to Max's studio and he would do the engraving. And to make a shape that is a circle on a complex curved piece of glass that reads as a circle visually uh, is incredibly difficult. To do two concentric ones <laughs> next to each other is bananas, just totally bananas. So the, the piece on the right, um, Max engraved seven identical circles in the back. And I cut this piece of Pyrex on a bias. So the bottom is thicker than the top. And um, the change in the ovality of the form is from the, from the optics of the glass. So working with a glass blower at Corning to develop new forms and a wider color palette. Um, that was great fun. I did a little bit of diamond inlay uh, in these pendants. And uh, these are also blown forms. And uh, I'd met a German manufacturing company at the Tucson Gem Show, which is a huge, unbelievable fair that happens about this time of year uh, out in Tucson, Arizona. 
uh, I guess probably not this year, but normal years. And uh, they're in Eder Oberstein, which is a German stone cutting center uh, near France. And um, they did the cutting on these for me. So the, the red one is the synthetic ruby about two inches long. And the other the others are black onyx uh, inlaid with diamonds. And they also did the, uh, the inlay on these pieces for me. So graphite molds. I wanted to make jewelry that magnified the clothing that was on. So I needed the lens forms. And after a period of experimenting, I figured out I needed spheres and cylinders for this to work optically. And I'd been an artist in residence at Canberra School of Art uh, for a couple of weeks in Australia. And um, Richard White, I talked to Richard Whiteley about it. He gave me an old funky block of graphite to play with. And while we didn't get anything usable out of it, it showed me the potential of the material. And when I got home, I knew what I wanted to do um, to make these work. And as you can see on the right, the different height of lenses magnify at different levels. So this is how the, these are done. I've already actually carved this mold. So this is really just a demonstration of the machine. And uh, I've got a piece of graphite in there. This is at the University of Wisconsin Madison in the metal studio uh, where they let me work for a little bit. And uh, I'm machining this. It's sort of a fancy drill press. It's called a milling machine. Kind of as a pencil And these are some of the molds I made out of it, a mold and then the forms hey, that I pulled from the mold. Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I didn't, I don't think we could hear you when the video was playing. Oh, okay. Couldn't hear me that. at all? <laughs> um, hmm. We can hear you now. Okay. Um, I'm hoping that the videos to come, that won't be the case. If you have any suggestions of how to deal with that, I'm all ears. Um, um, I will think on it. I don't have anything offhand, but I'll see okay, cool. find out. All right, we'll find out soon. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. So I continued to work with these forms, machining them with a milling machine and what's called a ball mill to make these um, carvings in the graphite. Color makes a huge difference in this work. Um, the one on the top, I've done three versions of it. One's in the permanent collection at Corning, the other is at the Museum of Arts and Design in New York. So this was one of the more challenging things I did technically, and I'll explain why. Uh, when this comes out of the mold, this is what it looks like. And I have to cut and grind away all that extra glass, keeping intact this relatively delicate piece that is the high points on this piece of glass. So it's really rather labor intensive. And uh, I'm often doing kind of backflips to get to minimal in my work, uh, but those flips don't always show. And again, this is how it ended up. So CAD, CAM, and CNC. CAD is computer-aided design. CAM is computer-aided manufacturing. Uh, and CNC is computer numerically controlled machining. Um, so what I'm gonna show you next is a video I took off of YouTube of a piece of graphite being machined. And since we're having trouble with the uh, audio at the same time, let's, um, I'm gonna explain it now and then we'll flip to the video. Um, so um, what they're machining I think is some sort of stove knob. Uh, and it'll start with a larger bit and then it'll automatically go up and switch bits to a smaller one, a finer one, so it can get more and more in the recesses of the design and work subtractively to develop the final form. So here it is. So can you hear me or no? 
Yeah, yes, I can just hear you then. You you can hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. All right, good. Good. It was just that one. So weird. Yeah. So now it's changed tool bits and it's moving in a much more deliberate way. Um, you know, it's sort of hogged off the majority of the material with a rougher bit. Now it's a smaller and finer one. And then it'll eventually change to an even finer one, but I'm gonna move on. So um, I was a visiting artist at Kendall School of Art in Grand Rapids, Michigan, where my friend Phil Renato teaches. And Phil is fluent in five or more different CAD softwares. I, I am not, I understand it well enough to talk to somebody about it, but I have not learned it myself. Um, so I was there for five days and I spent half the time with the students doing lectures, critiques and demos and half the time with Phil playing with their really cool high tech toys. And what I was doing was drawing and talking while Phil was on the computer screen. And the main body of work we made there was inspired by water and rippling wave patterns in water and the patterns of rake sand in the Zen gardens of Japan. So as you can see, we were able to get that water thing to work reasonably, reasonably well. Uh, and here, these are done through a process called press molding. And can you still hear me? Yeah. I hope you can hear me. All right, so these are done through a process called press molding. Here I'm working with a gaffer named Richard Jones and Madison. And we've taken a gather of glass. The glass is about 2000 degrees. And that's me with the sneakers and the, the Kevlar gloves on. Glass is placed into the mold and it's pressed down hard to conform to the mold. Next, we flip it out onto a wooden, wooden tray, and then Richard is gonna fire polish it. Uh, and to do that, he's hitting it with a very hot torch, and this smooths the surface and makes it glossier. Uh, it's much easier to do this with a torch than it is to do it by hand afterwards. And then he'll put it away in the annealer and it will kneel overnight for about 12 hours. And here are some of the pieces that came out of that. So um, I, I intentionally make the molds oversized and that way I can cut different shapes out of the same molds. There's a lot of time and effort and often expense in the molds. So I don't wanna just make one piece from, from a mold. I want ver variety. I continue to work with glass blowers in these forms. And these are also cut from blown forms. And here you see the CAD rendering uh, on the left in um, a software called Rhinoceros, Rhino, uh, and then my mold and then two pieces that came out of the mold. I've also done some two-part molds and to do these, uh, the two halves of the mold needed to be indexed perfectly. Um, so I, I went to Harbor Freight, I bought an Arbor Press for $50, cut it apart, re-engineered it and made clamps so my molds could be um, uh, mounted in the press, and you'll see this. So I'm working with Shana Live, a wonderful glass artist in her own right, in Madison, and she's already taken one gather of glass on the steel rod that's called a punty. Now she's going in. If there are any glass artists out here, you gotta love this, this push button door opening thing. She just steps on the pedal and the door opens and closes. It's pretty slick. So she's going into the, um, into the furnace. This is called a glory hole. Uh, to get the glass really good and hot for the press molding. And that's me on the left where you can just barely see a hand. Um, and once it's hot enough and goopy enough, uh, she'll move to the mold and um, put it into the mold. That's my little Arbor Press. Again, it comes out and she'll fire polish it with a small hot torch. And then I'll go with a big one to kind of even the heat out um, a bit before we put it in, into the annealer. So 
So this is a better look at the way it looks. So this looks like it's slow motion, but it's actually in real time. So you can see what's going on with the glass and my little press here. So um, I mentioned that I go up to Corning a lot and um, uh, I don't, I've lost count of how many workshops I've taken there. It's gotta be close to 20 by now. And that often shapes the direction of my work. Um, in this case, I took a fusing class with Kirsty Ray from Australia and these two pieces came out of it. And um, uh, I think it's kind of responsible for the technical range of what I do with glass, which is somewhat unusual in the field. It's not unheard of by any means, but I think I've got kind of a broader range of processes that I can now draw on. I've gotten to know the material very well. Um, I developed a new production line based on the water pieces. I took a rubber mold off my graphite mold and then made a liquid steel mold from that for a hydraulic press. Uh, made models in the hydraulic press and refined them and then had them cast on the, on the bottom. The top one is a straight pressing um, uh, with gold added, but the production, that's one of a kind, but the production earrings are, are cast. So uh, Shapeways is a 3D printing company, uh, international company, and they work with a huge range of materials, everything from wax to many different plastics to metal. Uh, and they, for a while, they did 3D printing in glass. Um, and I'll show you how that works. So this is a bin of recycled glass powder and an organic binder with an inkjet head, essentially dispensing the organic glue, building it up layer by layer. And it starts to look like uh, footprints in the snow as the glue sol solidifies the layer. At this point, the piece is, is fragile. They put it in an oven and cure it. And this solidifies the adhesive. And they intentionally blur out what the temperature is there, <laughs> I'm sure. Um, it then comes out and it's still in a green state, still very fragile. And what you'll see is actually a portrait of a couple at a wedding. So you can, you'll see the outline of a bride and groom. Uh, he's vacuuming out the loose glass that has provided a support for the piece while it fired. And um, that glass can then be reused in, uh, in the printer again. So you can see the groom on the left and the bride on the right there. This is not something of mine, by the way. Uh, it's then submerged into a high-tech sand, a sapphire sand, and that has a very high melting point. And it needs this because it'll shrink about 17, 18, 20% in the firing process as the glass sinters together. Here they show it. It's 750 degrees Celsius uh, fired. And these are some pieces that came out of it. These are, again, are not mine. These are pieces that they printed in the glass. And these are mine. So the two pieces on the left, I was looking to classical Greek columns for inspiration and uh, distorting them and making open hollow form brooches from that. The ones on the right were 3D printed in wax, uh, in plastic. And then I made a rubber mold and took waxes from those and then did a lost wax casting uh, to make these pieces in glass. Here you can see a mold and then how the glass is coming out of it and then two pieces formed from that. Um, I think of these as sort of cross currents and working with the wave ideas again. This is a current favorite. Sometimes everything goes right in a piece. Uh, I continue to work with blowers. So these are blown forms and the color is the inside of the bubble. And I seem to have an affinity for working subtractively. Um, it's been that way for a long time and it's something I really enjoy. So organic matter. Um, I wanted to work with some more organic forms and I let the materials sort of lead me out of that. Here I've molded shells and cast them. 
Uh, on the right, I took a mold off of a funky piece of wood uh, and cast it, but mainly I was trying to get at these. I had the idea to make these vegetable brooches, asparagus and celery for at least five years. And I kept pushing it aside saying, this is the silliest thing I've ever thought of and I shouldn't do it, shouldn't do it. And, you know, as you've seen, I've worked abstractly for my whole career and working um, with recognizable forms was absolutely outside of my comfort zone. But the idea would not leave, it, leave me alone. It, it, it haunted me. And finally, the only way to sort of exercise it was to try it and see if that voice in my head really had some validity. And I did, and uh, I ended up, it took me a while to warm up to these, but I ended up really liking them eventually. And it's interesting wearing them because people see the color first and then they see the form and then they realize what it is. And they I often get to laugh and I like that. These are my genetically modified asparagus. So these are a 3D print that's then cast, a small production line of these pieces. Um, and uh, working with an apple and an orange um, with gold stems and leaves. The one on the top is in the permanent collection of the Cooper Hewitt Design Museum of the Smithsonian. Uh, so this is a bit of how they're done. Uh, the silicon mold in the back is of a half of an orange and half of an apple. Uh, I then made a rubber original in that space and a uh, plaster silicone mold from the rubber original and then took a chunk of glass and cast it into the mold. The, the glass there uh, is ready for setting. It's, it's much smaller than the final casting would have been. So there was a lot of cold working to get to that point. So my butterfly brooch. I was invited to be in a butterfly jewelry exhibit uh, in Spain and uh, I made a glass butterfly, but it got me thinking about how peculiar the word is. And the silly punster in me came out and I made this brooch as a, out of wood and a label from Land O'Lakes. And my dear friend, Kristen Beeler makes these wonderful pearls with laser engraved flies on them. And I got one of Kristen's pearls and combined it to make this butterfly, my visual um, pun. And, um, you know, the kicker of the story is I sent it to the leading jewelry show in the world uh, in Munich, Germany called Schmuck. Um, that happens uh, around this time of year, every year, except this year. And uh, it got into the show and you could have knocked me over with a feather. So, you know, if you don't apply to things, you know you're not gonna get in. Applying, you never know. So this was a real surprise for me. Um, so I'd always wanted to do some larger work and every time I do a lecture like this, particularly if the images are projected and I see my brooches eight feet long on a wall, uh, I think about it more. And I got a, uh, a residency at the Herb Burroughs Glass Factory in Portland, Oregon. Uh, with the idea of making some larger work. So what you're going to see, this is four inch thick, medium density fiberboard. The form that it's carving with a CNC is about 25 inches across, to give you an idea of scale. And see if you can still hear me. We can hear you. Yeah, okay, good. Um, so as with the smaller pieces, it's working subtractively and, and uh, developing the form. After it was carved, I did hours of sanding and then lacquering and then sanding and then lacquering uh, to make my, um, my mold. I then cast the silicon rubber into that mold and shipped my rubber original, my rubber base form out to Oregon. Uh, once there, I constructed uh, a steel edge around it uh, to contain the plaster and then cast plaster into the mold. And that's the mold on the right. Um, I went through 750 pounds of plaster in two weeks and made 10 pieces. And it turned out I had exactly the right amount of plaster. I think I did my best to estimate it, what I needed, and then doubled it. And then it turned out to be exactly right, just out of dumb luck. Um, but, you know, I'd never done casting like this without adult 
adult supervision by somebody like Richard Whiteley or Dan Clayman. And I'd never done anything this scale. And mixing up, it was 75 pounds of plaster and about 30 pounds of water. So it's a hundred pounds of stuff. And the stuff is like concrete. And um, it was a little hairy, but I, after the first one, I had a little trouble. And then after that, they went pretty smoothly. So we loaded them into their two massive kilns. These are maybe 15 feet by nine feet kilns, the biggest I'd ever seen. Um, loaded them up with about 40 to 45 pounds of glass billets and fired them. And just two weeks later, it was Christmas morning. So. The thicker glass is, the longer it takes to anneal. And the, the annealing times go up geometrically as thickness increases. So the total firing cycle for these was actually about 13 days. Um, and I went home back to Wisconsin and, uh, and then came back uh, to open the kilns. And this is the work that came out of it. So again, this is about 25 inches across and about 45 pounds of glass. And I designed the stand to work with a sculpture and these as well. So um, I, I continue to use the press molded forms. Uh, this is a piece I'm also very fond of. Um, did some continuing work with a master lamp worker um, to make this necklace. Um, so Occam's razor is a very old scientific precept. I think it goes back to 1400s or something, uh, saying all things being equal, the simplest solution tends to be the right one. But <clears throat> getting to simple is anything but simple. You know, one thinks of something simple like E equals MC squared, but for Einstein to get to that was an unbelievable leap of creativity. Uh, and you know, not that I'm anywhere near that league, but for me to get to, to a simple solution is often really, really hard. So in this piece, the glass was blown for me during my residency in 2003. The chain was sitting in a drawer in my studio for 25 or 30 years unused. And um, I finally figured out how to bring the two of them together um, a good 12 years, 12, 14 years after the residency. And you know, that simple solution always seems so obvious with the benefit of 2020 hindsight, but getting there is often really, really challenging. Did a little bit of work in a class with um, UV sensitive uh, photosam lasting on the right, and then um, decals that are fired onto the glass on the left. So this is the current work, Lumina series. And it started um, during a, a 2017 workshop uh, with Sid Hutter at Corning on the use of UV cured adhesives. So glues that cure with UV light. And this work looks to the color field paintings of Mark Rothko, the light work of Dan Flavin, and the amazing architectural um, work with light of James Terrell. And I'm working with a material called dichroic glass. And it's, it's a material that tends to be very garish. And I've hated it for my entire glass career uh, for the most part. Um, but I found a way to use it through a, a diffusing surface to sort of calm it down. That's my photographer, Larry Sanders, modeling a brooch for me. Uh, this material, this process was developed by NASA for the visors of the astronauts and other aerospace applications. Um, so that helmet is coated with dichroic, is made out of dichroic glass. And it's a quartz and metal oxide coating on the glass. It's vaporized onto the glass. And it makes the work, it can be reflective and transparent at the same time, depending upon the angle of view. So these pieces sort of tend to glow from within. And often people think I have electric lights inside of them, but I'm, I'm just working with the optics of the glass. And the idea behind them really was that I wanted to make jewelry that responded to the fact that it's seen in motion. So the color intensity and the actual color itself changes as these are viewed from different angles. It's a quality that's unique to jewelry as a medium. These really change dramatically. So these are three views of the same, same two pieces. 
and um, uh, they're reliant on that central, what looks like a black piece of glass in the middle there, uh, is something I commissioned from the manufacturer that I croaked that has one color on one side and another color on the other. Uh, and then there's a third color on the back of the piece. So it really changes in a dramatic way. And this will show you a bit of what it looks like as it moves. And you can see how dramatically the colors change. These were really a challenge technically. I had to figure out my own tools to allow me to cut the glass in this way and then reconstruct it using the UV adhesives. But in the end, I was able to figure it out. So this shows, oops, this shows uh, two views of the same piece. You can wear it on either side, uh, either this yellow or green. Uh, so that's the same material that was commissioned from industry. Uh, and this in a similar way. So sometimes the changes are more subtle. I think they are in this piece. Sometimes they're more dramatic. Some of them are almost like an opal, uh, the stone. Um, and uh, that, one, that circle pin on the left, I'm particularly fond of. I've been, I bought a kiln about four years ago and I've been loving working in the kiln. So these are slumped forms. Um, and I'm doing something that probably shouldn't work. I'm slumping glass over glass, but that's how I got that circle form in there. So um, this is our former home in Rhode Island in Cranston. Um, it was built in 1677, so 57 years after the Pilgrims landed, and uh, the National Historic Registry lists the architecture type as post-medieval. Um, it wasn't a period I'd ever heard of before, but it was too early to be colonial. Um, it's the oldest private home in Rhode Island and one of the oldest in the country. This is where we are now. Um, in Madison, Wisconsin, we live in the University Arboretum, which is a large forest research facility for the university with a small enclave of houses in it and a lake and a wetland. Uh, the building on the top is my studio. It was a garage and wood shop for the previous owner. And I'll give you a little video tour of the studio. So we've got a rolling mill in front there. About two thirds of is set up for glass and a third set up for goldsmithing. We've got two major workbenches. That's my Ikea soldering cabinet, uh, literally an appliance garage from Ikea. That little thing with a towel on it is a hot box for curing adhesives. My main workbench and bench pin. Sweet little flex shaft drill press that I use for diamond drilling, probably the best $120 I ever spent. My small kiln, which is about 14 by 14 inside, a station for gluing and drawing and laying things out. And a central work table where I can lay things in progress out. Got a nice drill press there. But then on the left is my sandblaster and a huge compressor that powers that. The thing with a tire around it is my flat lap and I've got eight or 10 different abrasive discs that can go on that to take the work from rough grinding all the way to polish. And it's all a diamond abrasive and a six wheel diamond lapidary lathe and a, another small lathe and wet bets, belt sander and a diamond saw and a sweet little German engraving lathe. That's a thing of beauty. A uh, sparky fusion welder for doing production earrings and cufflinks, and a polishing motor. My adorable little dog, Josie, is a sweetie. Uh, my wife is an accomplished writer uh, and novelist and professor emeritus at the University of Wisconsin, where she directed one of the top uh, creative writing programs in the country. We love to travel. Our favorite trip was to, to the Galapagos Islands, a truly wondrous place, really amazing. Um, and these turtles 
they live a really long life. And we found out later that this one was actually the grandfather of Senator Mitch McConnell. And you can totally see the family resemblance. Really don't like that man. Uh, I'm on the board of the Craft Emergency Relief Fund, Surf Plus, and we provide grants to artists that are facing career threatening circumstances. And also something called Get Ready Grants for emerging artists to help them make their studio more safe. Um, so this piece is called Necklace for an Insecure Man. Uh, as was mentioned, I was president of the National Jewelers Organization, Society of North American Goldsmiths. And while I took the job really seriously and we got five times more done than I ever would have thought possible, it was hugely productive. Uh, I don't take titles very seriously. So we, when we did a fashion show, I thought I'd have a little fun. And my own sentiment here, the world is shaped by the activists as they take the time to be involved, to do the work. So whether you're in the arts or some other area, I urge you to try to make the world a better place. It certainly needs it right now. My photographers, James Beards, who's passed away, unfortunately, and Larry Sanders, of uh, Sanders Visual Images. So uh, this is my little advice to graduates, students, and emerging artists. So you've graduated, now what? You've lost your studio space and equipment, your peer group, and your time structure. You need to find a way to replace them all. Indirect mentoring. This is what I call find, finding someone who is now where you want to be in five years or in 10 years. And this field is incredibly generous. I can literally count on one hand the number of times somebody isn't open with a source or a material uh, or a connection. Um, so if you see somebody that fits this bill for you, don't hesitate to contact them. And it's so much easier now with email than it was in my time where you had to cold call somebody. But um, people are very generous in this field to a fault. Studio space, the shared studio cuts expenses, pools resources and provides support. One of the uh, good things about being a jeweler is you don't really need a huge amount of space and you don't need all that much equipment, but sharing a space can really help, especially early on. And if you do this, my advice is one of you buys the rolling mill, the other one buys the torch, the other one buys the belt sander or whatever else you need. Don't buy equipment together. So when you inevitably go your own way, you don't need a divorce attorney to settle things up. Structure, figure out how to structure your work time. This was a challenge for me. Do your homework, visit galleries and craft shows in person if you can before applying to them. You'll waste less of their time and less of theirs. Um, less of your time and less of theirs. Um, you know, you can get a huge amount from a gallery's website uh, now that wasn't available when I was coming up, um, but it's still really good to see the galleries in person. For jewelers, one of the open questions is how much of the work is actually out on display? I can provide $30,000 worth of jewelry for a gallery and then have it sit in a drawer uh, for most of the time. Be persistent. If this work is important to you, do what's needed to keep doing it. And whether this is waiting on table or working for somebody else, uh, if you're committed to it, uh, you find a way to do it. And I've gotten to a point where I've defined success as an artist as simply continuing to do the work. And I know that may seem like a low bar, um, but that is bottom line, that is what it's about for me. Keep growing, don't rest on your laurels. Be generous, share what you know with others and build community. Network, go to conferences and openings, grow your visibility and your contacts. Be professional, this is a small field and everyone talks, so don't be a jerk. Word gets around really quickly. Um, honor your commitments, be on time. Work hard. There are no pa easy paths in our field. Teaching and full-time studio work are both challenging and demanding. You know, I wish something like part-time teaching paid decently, but the reality is it doesn't. It's horrible um, financially. Um, the, to me, the greatest thing the world could do is make part-time teaching pay decently. 
that would be great for the artistic world, but it's not the reality now. Photos, get great photos of your work. More people will see your photos than the actual work. They're the magic key to press coverage. Absolutely vital. Build a website and post those gorgeous photos you just had shot. Travel when you can, see the world. Fear. I know this is scary. Those first steps after school have what I call the aura of permanence. But to me, that aura of permanence is an illusion. It's a fallacy. You know, you try something uh, that doesn't work, you try something else. But those, to me, that those first steps, you can get paralyzed in them. Uh, at least uh, I felt like I could. And um, uh, you just need to be bold and, you know, sort of push ahead. But keep in mind, it could be worse. You could be poets. So this is the class this summer, and that's my show. Thank you, Don. I love your ending words of wisdom. We do have a whole bunch of questions. Um, so okay. thank you all for hanging in here, and we'll jump right into them. Uh, okay, shoot. So let's see, Alice Spritzen. I'm thinking of taking your workshop, but am not a production jeweler, nor do I expect to be one. Do you think the content of your workshop could be useful to me anyway? Can the processes you are teaching be used for one of a kind work? They this absolutely- is the workshop at Peters Valley. Yeah, uh, they absolutely can. And uh, you know, I actually don't think this class needs to be metal specific. Most of the processes are metal oriented, but uh, some of them like water jet cutting that I'm gonna talk about uh, can be applied to glass or, or steel and um, you know, laser cutting to a wide range of materials. Those, uh, those pierced out uh, uh, cement mixers in the beginning of the talk by Wim DeVoe uh, from Belgium are a good example. They're one of a kind unique objects uh, in a massive scale and a you know, full scale truck um, that would be impossible without uh, laser cutting or water jet cutting of the steel. Um, so, you know, to me, there are so many cool processes out there that can be applied to work. And, um, you know, the production processes, they can make work less expensive. They can make it more quickly. They can mean uh, there's less work by your hands, but they can also, you know, change materials and change scale, and uh, they're really adaptable. And what I always tell students is, um, uh, you don't need to know how every process works. You just need to be able to talk to somebody who knows, who does know. You need to be able to communicate to them, and that's a pretty easy thing to learn. And that's a lot of what the class is about. Um, and to make you more comfortable to approach people like that. So, so please, please come. Don, um, somebody did request that you stop sharing your screen because it's just got the Zoom and they want to see your face. Um, but, and also with the class, right. I know with COVID, I think we have a smaller class size than usual. So if you are thinking about taking this class, you should sign up really quickly, because I think, especially after this lecture, it's, it's, um, it's probably going to fill up. So don't delay. Um, let's see. So Rich Howden asks, how deep in corn painting influenced jewelry, Ocean Park or Russian River periods? Um, wow, where, <laughs> must have read something, an old article or something to get that. Um, he's still my favorite painter, uh, Richard Diebenkorn. And those Ocean Park, uh, paintings, uh, you know, I come around the corner of a museum and they still take my breath away. Um, his ability to find geometric abstraction in a landscape uh, is truly remarkable, but his entire career was amazing. I saw a retrospective many years ago at the Whitney, I think, and uh, it was his whole career going from figurative to landscape to abstraction, and you could you could literally see him learning from one body of work to the next um, because it was set up chronologically. Um, so he's, he's still, like I said, he's still my favorite painter. Um, probably always will be. 
So let's see the next question. Um, do you seal or treat your sandblasted pieces? Um, generally not. Um, what the question implies is that there are things like uh, liquid luster, which is something glass artists use. And it's a, a, a goo that you rub on the glass and it, uh, it makes them fingerprint proof. Um, and it sort of seals the surface. Um, I, I have very, very rarely used that. What I'm more often doing is if I'm sandblasting these days, most of the time I'm etching it after the sandblasting. And the etching is done with a material called no sand, which was developed for the denture industry. And um, a lot of glass artists work with it. So it's not, it's not sort of full on hyperfluoric, which is super nasty and you do not want to mess with. Um, but unfortunately, the company that makes it went out of business. And um, so I've got one gallon of it that I've been using for years, a bit at a time. Uh, I'm very careful with it. And, um, uh, you know, the pieces are etched from, you know, a few minutes to 15 minutes uh, in a mild acid solution. And that seals up the surface and makes them sort of juicier uh, in the glass. In the recent stuff, a lot of that surface that you would think was sandblasted uh, was actually hand lapped, and which is a process of using loose silicon carbide grit and water and a little soap on a sheet of glass and rubbing it on the glass. And that uh, makes a surface that can be really, really silky and it's not prone to fingerprints. And I can very carefully control the degree of translucency and transparency, which is, is vital to those pieces. Um, I've also figured out a, what I call power hand lapping. Uh, uh, I, I got a sheet of glass cut to my specs for my flat lap, and I can put loose grip, grit on that, and that increases the uh, uh, efficiency of getting that surfaced. Um, uh, anyway. All right, next question. Um, and I do see some questions coming into the chat. If, you, if you've posted a question in the chat, please repost it in the question and answer because that way we're able to say that we've answered it and it's a lot easier for us to keep track. So we're not gonna be um, looking at the chat. We'll stay on the Q and A's. <laughs> okay, so um, have you considered creating mezuzahs? Your work seems like it would make the per be perfect for this object. Um, yeah, um, you know, I, I, I did a show in West Palm Beach, uh, Florida, um, at the Norton Art Museum, and it's a large Jewish population. And I started counting the number of times some people asked, uh, are these mezuzahs during, uh, during the day? And uh, I, I have to admit, they do look like that sort of form. Um, you know, my thinking is they would be really expensive mezuzahs, but if somebody wanted to do that, I, I'm willing to give it a try. If you want to put a, you know, $800 brooch on your door frame, great, I'll, I'll, I'll make it work. <laughs> um, um, but, and I, I've done a little, I've done very little bit of Judaica. There was a, there is a woman named Clay Barr who, put together an amazing collection of Torah pointers from artists uh, all over the States and I think abroad and had a major show at a Jewish museum in New York City. And I did a Torah, glass and gold Torah, Torah pointer for that, but that's about as far as I've gone. Do you cast your own work or find it more efficient and cost-effective to outsource? Uh, I outsource it. Um, you know, there, there are things like casting and plating where uh, industry can do it so much more efficiently. And if you're doing lost wax casting, I assume you're talking about the metal and the production, not, not the glass, which I showed uh, some of the casting of that. Um, but um, uh, I outsource it to companies in Rhode Island, which is the national center for the costume jewelry industry. Uh, I'll give you, this is a big tip. Uh, I work with, uh, company called Harrison Casting in Johnston, Rhode Island. Uh, they're affordable, they do beautiful work. They'll um, 
uh, either bright dip or tumble your pieces right there. And for 10 to 20 cents a piece, they'll take the sprues off, which is any jewelers out there know that is like total no brainer um, to have, have that work done. Um, you know, lost wax casting, the, the fumes from the, the wax burning out are nasty. Uh, I don't want them in my house. Plating is even worse. Um, so I, I do not hesitate to work with industry and uh, to subcontract things. Um, works well. Anna Lopez says, great talk. With your interest in glass, metal, and jewelry, it is surprising that you have not gravitated towards vitreous enamels. Can you speak to that? Um, you know, I, 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 with the exception of an enamel butterfly I made in camp for my mother, uh, I've, never, uh, I, I, I've never worked with enamel. Um, I always thought of it as a, more as a painterly medium. And I am very much not a painter. Uh, I, I am a 2D or 3D guy, uh, you know, sculptural form. Um, and things like painting and drawing are not things that I'm good at. And uh, I can draw to record ideas and, um, you know, work through variations. Uh, and the drawings are good enough for my purposes but uh, I, I still don't draw particularly well, and I guess never will at this point. It seems too like you use the materials more for the form, right? Like expressing the form. And like you're saying, where like the enamel would be more of like a 2D depiction yeah. for that. Yeah. And there are also, there's some people oh, doing really good work uh, in it as well. And uh, I didn't mention this, but you know, when I got involved in cutting the semi-precious stones, there, were, there was very little interesting work being done in those materials. So I saw an opportunity for exploration and that I could bring my own voice to it. Um, but with people out there like June Schwartz I showed, who's passed away at age 95 or so a few years ago, who was amazing. Jamie Bennett's still working. Uh, William Harper is still working as far as I know. Um, you know, there are a lot of really good anomalists working today. Do you have a picture of some insect that would represent Wisconsin Senator Ron Johnson? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll work on that for the next lecture. Um, yeah, some sort of dung beetle, beetle I think. So how I started reading that one is a serious question. <laughs> um, do you have any thoughts or information you could share for students or new pr practitioners on adapting your practice to fit the constraints of less equipped post-graduation studio spaces? Um, I'm not sure. I, it, it's such a specific thing. If you want to email me later and show me what you're doing, um, I'm happy to look. And uh, I could advise you more specifically, but it's really individual. You know, I, I worry about, you know, people come out of someplace like Tyler School of Art, which is fantastic, particularly with Doug Bucci and uh, the other faculty there. Uh, it's a brilliantly equipped studio, but, you know, students are not going to have likely have access to some of that uh, amazing 3D printing equipment, but they can use service bureaus uh, to get the printing done. So. Uh, you don't always need to have the equipment yourself. Um, you know, there's a fantastic sculptor who I was in school with, Peter Diebenbrock, uh, um, and who's in Rhode Island, married to Didi Sudam, who's a very good jeweler. Um, and uh, Peter has a production line and, you know, he's using, you know, five different sorts of subcontractors, one that's casting resin, one that's electroforming, another one that's casting uh, in, <clears throat> in developing his production line. So uh, there are advantages to the subcontracting, but, you know, it, it, again, it just depends on what you need and want to do. I, I knew what I needed for my work at the time when I got out. And one of the things I did that I think had some wisdom to it was uh, when I was in school, these two schmucks from Texas named the Hunt Brothers tried to corner the silver market. 
this is late seventies and they drove silver from $5 an ounce up to $50 an ounce. And I don't even remember where gold went. Um, but the byproduct of that was, uh, and they ended up going bankrupt big time, uh, which they deserved. But, um, a lot of jewelry industry places around Providence went out of business. So I, I started getting the Providence newspaper and looking at the used tools and equipment for sale uh, column uh, every day. And I, I scored huge. And uh, I got this retiring tool maker's entire lifetime supply of chasing tools, engravers, machinist cabinets, micrometers, calipers, hammers, all kinds of stuff. It was, it was so much stuff that the, the wheels of my Volkswagen Rabbit were scraping the wheel wells every time I hit a bump, making an ungodly noise that scared the heck out of me uh, the first time. But um, so I, I was lucky and maybe resourceful. Um, I'm a pretty resourceful guy, as you might, might have gathered, I think, um, uh, in that way. Anyway, I hope that answers the question. And yeah, and there's like maker spaces, places, and true. Make a friend, right? Meet a jeweler at, you know, uh, a conference or something, and maybe you never know what will happen. Or um, yeah, yeah. So, oh gosh, sorry about that. My phone is ringing. <laughs> um, okay, next question. So let's see. Anne Marika says, hi, Don, thank you for the wonderful images and ideas. If you could get glass to do something it doesn't, it doesn't now, what would it be and what would you do with it? Um, it's not exactly something it doesn't do now. It's something it doesn't do now for, for me. Um, uh, Mark Pizer, who's in the Penland area, uh, who's a brilliant glass chemist and artist, um, works with this uh, uh, glass that he developed himself uh, that has a uh, opal-like quality, you know, the stone opal. Uh, and I would love to get my hands on some of that. It would be so good for my magnification pieces. And um, I've found other ways to get to that aesthetic to some extent, um, but I, I would love to get, you know, some piece that failed on Mark's glass. But you know he's developing his own chemistry. He's kind of a mad scientist, developing his own glass chemistry and uh, using it in his own work. If if you're curious about the work, uh, look up his Palomar series, like the the telescope. Um, they're just stunningly beautiful objects. Your career has evolved so richly and unexpectedly. What's next? What what do you expect to do next with respect to experimentation and creativity? Uh, I'm gonna continue with the dichroic glass for the foreseeable future. I'm still finding a lot of new things I can do with it. Um, uh, at some point, I'd love to uh, play with some larger scale with that. Um, I'm hoping to apply for another Corning residency, which I likely won't get, but if I do, that will be the subject of it. Um, you know, you know, something like um, uh, new warm, cold, and hot approaches to dichroic glass. So um, I have some ideas of what I could do with that, um, and maybe at some point I'll do it on my own. That material is expensive, so um, that like a, a full set, it comes in 19 inch round pieces. And um, for that custom two color glass uh, that I talked about, that's about $260 for one piece of glass. Uh, so it would, it would take some investment to do some larger scale work with that. Um, and with no sh assurance that it's gonna do what I think it's gonna do. Um, you know, mostly things do what you hope, but occasionally, you know, it, it's it's a fragile medium uh, in in many ways, and um, so anyway, that's what that's what I have in mind next. And there, what you know, often with things like the vegetable pieces, ideas are cooking in my head three to five years before they actually come out, 
and um, um, but I, you know, they often need that baking time. That's the way I think of it as baking time. And a, you know, you know, a form uh, like those, the the kind of sail like curved pieces uh, out of thin glass. I drew that form for like four or five years. I would see it in Quonset huts and all these different places and. Uh, I finally figured out how to use it. And um, often it needs that time. So we'll see. Is there a symbolic meaning to the inverted equilateral triangle? Um, I don't think of it so much, but um, uh, I think I'd be blind not to recognize that um, you know, the Nazis used that form to indicate homosexuality uh, in the camps. And uh, I'm not thinking in that direction, but other people sometimes have seen uh, that, that form in it. Uh, for me, mostly it's a matter of the fact that it, it both, I like it aesthetically, it sits well on the body. And it, a lot of those pieces are both necklaces and brooches. And it, it hangs really nicely as a necklace. Mm. Uh, it kind of fits with the, the line, if I go back a little bit, mm -hmm. the line of the clothing and sits really nicely uh, uh, on the chest. So I, I like that as well. And I, you know, I tend to, uh, you know, I was pretty bauhaus -y geometric before I got to RISD and RISD beat whatever, was not that out of me uh, uh, over over time, you know, and uh, I guess some of that still exists. I do try to push out of it uh, from time to time with things like the the celery pieces and uh, more organic forms. Um, I, I didn't say it at the time when I was talking about them, but the the celery and the asparagus are literally lost celery casting mm -hmm. and lost asparagus casting. I'm actually making a plaster mold of the actual vegetable, burning it out, and then doing a second firing to test uh, the glass into it. So. I love those pieces. Those asparagus, I think I saw them in a maybe Metalsmith magazine or something, and I was very taken aback by them. So those pieces in particular. Um, okay, so Alice has another question about the workshop. Can you explain what will be taught? Will you be Will we be creating using some of these techniques? Um, we, we don't really have access to direct access to the processes. The workshop is, is focused on exposing you to what's possible and helping you understand it well enough to talk to somebody um, in a manufacturing, getting you more comfortable with the process of actually approaching a company and what they'll often need and, uh, and then making prototypes. And, you know, if you're looking at something like um, commercial photo etching or laser cutting, a jeweler saw works perfectly adequately for developing a, a prototype. Um, you know, if we had access to that technology and we had a month long class, maybe that would be doable, but it, it's not. And I don't think it's necessary. So, you know, given how small the class is, I think it's going to be kind of a almost like individual tutorials on developing production. And um, the other side of it is um, I have some exercises pointed towards trying to clarify your own voice and, and to find the things that make your heart beat faster. Um, we kind of start with that, uh, with an assignment that I ask you to bring with you. Uh, to the class. And um, so there'll be a bit of that too. Nice. Do you have an interest in doing more in torch formed glass, soft or borrowed? Um, I could see collaborating with, uh, with a lamp worker again. Uh, you know, I, I didn't talk about it, but I took one glass blowing class at RISD and I dropped everything on the, on the floor. Uh, it's a one little vase that was about eight inches tall and 10 years after I graduated, it spontaneously exploded and it didn't leave a note, but I suspected it committed suicide. Um, you know, I, I found very little with a possible exception of basketball that I have less natural ability at than hot working glass. 
And, uh, but I can go to Corning or, or work with somebody here and hire them. And I, I know the process well enough to be able to talk to them about it. And I've actually gotten to know it fairly well, but um, the idea of going in and just, you know, doing much more than taking a gather of that 2000 degree stuff it doesn't appeal to me at all. Um, I'm not sure if I answered the question, but um, what was the question again? Oh gosh, I don't even have it. There's so many questions. Yeah. We'll just move on. Um, we've got, I think, two two more questions. And thanks everyone for staying with us. This has been really special. So um, Barbara asks, who, if anyone, do you talk with about your ideas? You seem very self-sufficient and self-reliant. What is your process for idea development? Um, you know, early on, there were a few people that were really good um, sort of feedback. Uh, one was a jeweler and he moved back to the Czech Republic and we kind of lost touch. And one of them passed away and the other one I lost touch with. And it's, it's hard as a established person to, to find somebody where you can have a, um, a really good dialogue about the work. Um, there are a few good friends. Kristen Beeler was somebody I mentioned who did those pearls. Um, and although we don't really talk so much about my work, we talk about all kinds of other things. And there are a lot of good friends in the field. Um, it's a really nice group. Um, but uh, mostly, I, you're right, I'm kind of self-sufficient and working off my own steam. Um, and, um, um, you know, the ideas, sometimes they come from process, sometimes they come from workshops. Um, you know, one of the great things about Corning is I can work with, you know, world-class artists for two weeks and learn a new process and explore what they have to offer. And, um, uh, often that will take me in a new direction. Off, oftentimes that takes years for it to actually come out in the work uh, into something finished. Uh, in the case of the Lumina series, that was not the case. That, that series started right in the class. And uh, you know, I've been running with it for the last three years. Um, so uh, I think as, a, as an artist, it's, it's a great artistic indulgence to be a student again. And one of the best things about being an artist is that it can lead to a lifetime of learning and growth. Um, if you work it right. And that's why I'm such a fan of teaching and uh, also of, of taking classes. I couldn't agree more. Have you considered working harder on your basketball now that you are, are a late middle-aged guy? Seems a shame to waste that seven foot seven frame. That's yeah. from my brother. <laughs> Is that from my brother? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. <laughs> Love you. Um, let's see. How do you learn to work off your own steam? Um, you know, I've thought a bit about this, and RISD, RISD kind of established um, an artistic momentum is the best way I can I can characterize it. And that sort of fueled me through the early years that those, I came in as a sophomore, which all transfers do. And those three years of really focusing full-time um, uh, in an art school, um, you know, I was in a small art department at the University of Vermont that had limited capacity. I mean, it was great. It was a great place to get started. You know, I was really starting from ground zero there and, I, I wouldn't have been able to handle RISD early on. I was not equipped for it. But by the time I got there, I was just about to turn 25 and I ate it up with a spoon and really tried to take advantage of it uh, as much as possible. And um, uh, that started a, a, a creative momentum that have helped fuel me through the early years. And the, the other big X factor is, uh, is making commitments. So uh, my friend Jan Yeager used to talk about the risk of public embarrassment as being a great motivator. You know, if I've got a show at a gallery uh, with a hard deadline or a crash show coming up where I need new work, 
um, you know, I, I always get more finished work done in the month before a show than I do the three months put together before that. Um, those deadlines, and, and that was my approach with, you know, continuing, that I talked about getting into three galleries, that was part of it. It was giving myself an assignment, uh, a, a deadline, because I knew I was not gonna be great at, at um, um, you know, um, organizing my own time and, and uh, uh, having that deadline is still uh, important to me. It's, it's sort of, it's what's made it a little bit hard to motivate during all this year of COVID. I haven't been all that productive, but I, I need to get back to it now. Uh, there's, it's hard when there's nothing out there coming. I hear you. <laughs> So we've got a comment here. I'm not quite sure who this is from, but it says, thanks so much, Don. Your talk has certainly made my heart beat faster. Just wonderful to see the body of your work over time. Oh, thank and you. then I think we've just got one last question, maybe also a relative, Sarah Overbeck Friedlich. Yeah. With your interest in optical play, have you ever experimented with Ulexite? I don't know what that is. Maybe it's a type. A type of plastic? And I don't, I don't know. U L, U L E X I T E. Yeah, I, 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 I have it because I've never heard of it. <laughs> but um, say, say. oh, it's natural fiber optic stone. Oh, oh, okay, all right. I, I, I've seen some work done in it, and usually it's um, uh, spheres of it that that are like a, a pool ball um at the tucson gem show and it does have some really interesting qualities i've never seen uh a source for sort of raw chunks of it that i could then carve up um, um but it yeah it it got some pretty amazing qualities it's sort of like a um a tiger eye mm. uh, and its optics it has a coins to it I, I never knew the name of it before. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Well, that's all our questions. Do you have any famous last words you'd like to say? Um, well, I hope to see some of you this summer and, um, you know, keep working out there and um, keep making good work. And maybe I'll see you at a conference when this whole thing is done and we have, can have a gathering of the vaccinated. There you go. <laughs> Hopefully. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. What a treat. Thank you so much, Don. It's been a pleasure. And um, everyone, we're going to post this on YouTube. And so please watch it there, share it there and have a great night. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much for tuning in. We would like to thank our sponsors for making programs like this possible. If you liked this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel to receive more like it in the future.